Welcome back, Storm fans. I am Brent Cook, and today we're going to talk about my top four finish at Star City Games Baltimore SCG Con, whatever you would like to call it, if you haven't heard of that. And if you're not interested, this is probably going to be a pretty long deck tech, so you can go ahead and skip ahead if you don't care about the list or any of the changes or anything like that. But I think it's going to be worthwhile. You should stick around, hear me out a little bit. All right, so this is actually a donation deck from my winning and opponent Hunter Sandlin, who was on Black Saga Storm, and they wanted to see the evolution of the list. They didn't know about what I ended up playing, which I'll get to in just a moment. It's kind of spicy and a little bit old at the same time. So in front of you is the list that I played two weeks ago, and it went live on Monday. So I'm not sure if this video is going to be a week out or a few days out. I haven't decided when I'm publishing it yet, but this was the list I played. At the end, I talked about not being 100% sure about it. I kept on testing it over that time period. And ultimately, I realized that 11 lands was just too few. And it's tough to play 11 lands with Brainstorm and have the correct number of fetches while having the right number of fetchables, all that good stuff. And I was a little torn at the end. I felt like there was something here. But I took a good long look in the mirror and I realized that there was a flaw in this deck list that I've been choosing to ignore for a little while. And I kind of think I solved it over the course of the next week or so, which would have been a week ago. And we'll just hop on right in and talk about it. So this was the last video and this is the start of the evolution. So I think... I realized when I, in my last video, I talked about playing tons of different deck lists and really recognizing some of the weaknesses that the Epic Storm had. And if you look at the evolution of this deck over the last year and a half, it's changed a lot. Like at one point, we had two copies of Defense Grid, and then those left for main deck Galvanic Relay. And part of the reason why was Prismatic Ending. Well, we've been playing Wishclaw Talisman this whole time in the face of Prismatic Ending. Okay, maybe not the best choice, but we did it. And that was fine for a while. It really was. But what I think pushed it over the edge was Urza's Bobble to fully dedicate ourselves to Galvanic Relay. On top of that, Urza's Bobble is another free card to easier create Hellbent for Infernal Tutor. So sort of dual purpose there. Okay, so 12 lands, 8 Bobbles, 4 Urzas, 4 Mishras, and... It's been going pretty well, okay, but ultimately what happened was Urza Saga started seeing a lot of play, and Prismatic Ending started seeing a lot of play post Modern Horizons 2. It's something we've been dealing with for the last year and a half, and that pushed the defense grids out of the deck, but it never pushed the Wishclaw Talisman because we weren't looking at it as a slot that could be cut until I sort of went into the tank over the last month testing all these wild lists, and I started you know, playing this list here, and I just began to realize how often I was holding Wishclaw Talismans because I couldn't afford it to be hit by Beseju or Prismatic Ending, or if I did play it out, I had to use it before I wanted to because Saga could go get Pithing Needle, and it was just really, really awkward. So I began testing these Infernal Tutor lists, and holy moly was I blown away. My win rate was through the roof, and I was like, okay, well, this created a three-mana line. Well, Infernal Tutor plus three mana line for a main deck copy of Galvanic Relay. The list actually got faster, and I was quite impressed. But one of the things that had to leave in order to make this happen was there's no main deck copy of Echo of Aeons anymore. If you go super far back, and I mean 2019 back, to the first Wishclaw Talisman video, I talk about how we couldn't play Infernal Tutor anymore because it didn't work with Echo of Aeons. That's true, still to this day. And the reason why is if you sacrifice your hand to become Hellbent, to the Lion's Eye Diamond, and then you search out an Echo of Aeons, how do you get to the graveyard? You need a pair of Lion's Eye Diamonds in order for that to work. And if you're going to have a pair of Lion's Eye Diamonds, why not just go get the Ad Nauseum, right? Like, it just makes sense. So there's no need for a main deck copy of Echo of Aeons that can become our fourth Urza's Bobble. And it's just provided a lot of consistency that I've really enjoyed. And now we're truly dedicated to Galvanic Relay is our secondary engine in the deck. We're still a primary Ad Nauseam deck. We will always be that. But Galvanic Relay is pushing up and it's really competing with Ad Nauseam. It is truly the secondary engine of the deck at this point. And it's really nice that 
the things that reward one also reward the other. Zero mana spells, great with ad nauseum. Zero mana spells, terrific with Galvanic Relay. And it's just the synergy within our deck that's really made it function. So I was thinking about this, and I was like, well, if we're really trying to push the advantage on Galvanic Relay, why not go Grixis? Because you could play four Thoughtseize in the main deck, and Thoughtseize plays into Infernal Tutor, Galvanic Relay a lot better. Well, the problem is that Veil's Armor is just broken. Like, that's the honest answer. So you could go Grixis, you lose the power of Veil of Summer, and then you don't get great sideboard options like Abrupt Decay. And you really need Abrupt Decay for killing a Collector Oof out of Blue Zenith, or Chalice of the Void out of 8 Cast. There's a ton of different examples I can make here. But this card just is really a game changer. There's also some things like Xanid Swarm, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I just think that green is ultimately worth it. Originally, we added it to protect Echo of Aeons, but at this point, the card's just so powerful and so useful that I don't think you can really get away from it. On top of that, we're not playing Ponder. We haven't played Ponder in some time. Veil of Summer is a cantrip. It is a part of this Urza's Bobble suite in a way. We have a bunch of redraws that aren't necessarily sculpting. Well, Mishra's Bobble is a little bit. But you, you get what I'm saying here, is it helps find the Burning Wish or Infernal Tutor sometimes when you just can trip it in an ideal moment. So Veil of Summer sticking around. Okay, so this was a list that I played. I 5-0'd a few times with it. Like I said, I was running really hot. But ultimately, I felt that it was a little bit weak to the prison decks on Magic Online. I, when I was losing, it was usually too... Moon Stompy or Red Stompy, whatever you would like to call it, and then Red White Initiative. So I made a change and I started tracking that here. It's 14.6 as two Crash, two Zandit Swarm, no Thoughtseize. Okay, so this is a little bit interesting. And this is what I ended up running in the Legacy Showcase on Magic Online. I ultimately didn't do, or no, I believe I ran 14.5. I ran 14.5 and wished that I played 14.6. That's what ended up happening. Because I had created this deck list before the showcase, and then I chickened out, and I played 14.5 because my win rate with this was just insane. And then I lost to a ton of Moon Stompy, and it was miserable. So I, I wished that I had played the Crashes. So I said, hey, Bryant, SEG Baltimore is coming up this weekend. You're going to play Crash. Okay. So I played this in the main event. And let's talk about that a little bit. So here is my data spreadsheet. This is a public thing. You can find it at theepicsfirm.com slash data. It is always on there. Or theepicsfirm.com slash decklist. It's on both. And you'll notice that I 5 0 a league right before Baltimore. And I was a little bit worried that it was going to get published and people would see my tech. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But I was running hot with this list too. And then I ran it in the main event. You'll see here, there's only eight entries. It was a nine round event. So I went 4-4 four, four drop, which isn't exactly the best record. When we look at the event, I faced this lovely person, Jack Simmons, in the first round on blue-white stone blade. Technically, it was Asper stone blade with a light black splash. And I just put them in the dirt, if I'm being completely honest with you. Uh, game one, I had double Galvanic Relay. Game two was Xandit Swarm and Appear into the Abyss on turn four. And, you know, just did my thing. Round two is death and taxes. And I'm really, really mad at myself over this match. I was able to keep a hand where I could set up an upkeep ad nauseum on my opponent's turn, knowing that they're on death and taxes. That when they were shuffling, they accidentally dropped the Spirit of the Labyrinth or Athalia. I can't remember. But it was one of those two. And I was able to see, oh, they're on death and taxes. They also revealed a Yorian, so that was sort of out there. And... I have an upkeep ad nauseum on their turn. They won the die roll. So that means that they have a turn to Thalia or Spirit of the Labyrinth, most likely. So I cast ad nauseum in their upkeep. I draw a whole bunch of cards. They play Thalia. They pass the turn. So I start doing math. And in my math, I realize that I have enough mana to go Burning Wish for Grape Shot. And then Grape Shot the Thalia and win. Here's the kicker. I forgot about the extra mana on the Grape Shot itself. So it's actually one mana short. And when I was trying to create metal craft for the Mox Opal that was already on the battlefield, I played out a Lion's Eye Diamond instead of something like a Mishra's Bobble or an Urza's Bobble. And when I was one mana short, I had to pass the turn. My opponent attacks me to one life with their Thalia. And then they play a Skyclave Apparition, eating my Lion's Eye Diamond. 
Okay, that's awkward. So I untap. I have to kill both their creatures, and I do, but then they play Stoneforge Mystic and Alliance Sash. I'm able to create a huge Empty the Warrants turn for 16 goblins, and then they top deck Cauldra, and I lose the game. So I'm able to chump block for a little while, but I'm never able to get back into the game. So ultimately, I lose that game two. I mulligan to five on the play. I have a turn two. They have turn one deafening silence into Wasteland into Thalia. I'm sorry, they have a turn one deafening silence into Wasteland Thalia. And I'm just done. Uh, so I lose this one because I made a bonehead mistake in game number one by playing out the Lions at Diamond. I then get paired into the Bug Scam deck where they show me a Sylvan Library when they're shuffling and lead on Trop Ponder. And that is Tropical Island Ponder. So I think that they're on like a four color pile. It turns out they're on the scam pile with grief and reanimate. So I infernal tutor on turn two for a second dark ritual. So that way on my turn three, I have Velisummer plus ad nauseum. Instead they grief reanimate and I'm just putting the dirt game two. I mulligan. They have opposition agent and collector roof. Like I just get destroyed and my events realistically over because two losses doesn't make top eight. Round number four, I get paired into Andy Joy, who is wearing a Cooperstown shirt, which is a uh, town in New York State where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. We talk about baseball. It's a lot of good fun. But ultimately, I kind of crush Andy with Galvanic Relays. The card's just so good in the four-color uh, hot bant matchup, whatever you'd like to call it. I then have an insane matchup against Doomsday. All right, so my Doomsday opponent, this is probably the coolest match on the weekend, if I had to uh, guess. So they're on the play. They go Dark Ritual Doomsday Pass. I have an unprotected turn one. I go all in. They force a will me. Okay, so you've opened up a turn one Doomsday into turn two win. Like they also untap and win after force of willing me. So their hand is very, very, very good. Game two, I go turn one Xanid Swarm. They force of will it. They have turn one Doomsday. I turn two them. Okay. So we, we're, you know, rolling high. We're doing well. Game three, they go Underground Sea Ponder. And I'm like, yes, finally, not a turn one Doomsday. So I play Xanid Swarm again, and they force a will it. Okay. So on turn two, they go Land, Lotus Petal, Doomsday. They have two cards in hand. On their end step, I activate both of my uh, Urza's Bobbles, and I reveal a cantrip of like a Ponder or something, plus Force of Negation. And I'm like, holy moly, what are these draws? And I already have a pair of Lion's Eye Diamonds in play and a Mox Opal. I think I like had to play them out in order to cast the Xanid Swarm or something. I don't really remember. So I get two Bobble draws plus my draw step. And one of the Bobble draws is a Brainstorm and the other is a Veil of Summer. So I actually hit pretty well. I play my land, I cast the Veil of Summer, and it resolves. They decide not to force of negation it. But now I have a brainstorm, a pair of lion's eye diamonds, a land, and maybe like a rite of flame or a dark ritual in my hand. So I decide that I have to go all in. Like it's either now or never. So I cast the brainstorm, and maybe one of the rituals, and I crack the lion's eye diamonds. I end up having seven mana floating. So I think it was actually a rite of flame. And I draw the three one at a time. I hit another brainstorm. So I'm able to brainstorm now. And if I hit, maybe we go there. Because I'm down to six mana now. So Infernal Tutor isn't quite as good. But maybe I can uh, Burning Wish for Grape Shot. Like that might have been lethal. I'd have to go check my life pad or something. But I look at a fourth card deep. And it's not it either. So I ultimately end up losing the match. But holy moly was it high power. It was just sweet. And then... We get paired against four color control again. I win game number one pretty easily. Game two, I go all in on a turn one and they force of will me. And then game three, I have a turn one again. They mulligan to four. And I, I'm trying to remember here. I kept a hand that was like Lotus Petal, Lotus Petal, Rite of Flame, Dark Ritual, Lion's Eye Diamond, Infernal Tutor, and maybe another ritual. Like I have no permanence, nothing, no hand. I go all in. They force me. And, but they mold the four. So they go like land ponder after. 
I end up winning this game on like turn like 15 or 20 with all five of my fetchable lands in play off of the back of Galvanic Relay. It was so powerful. And it just really showed like the power of Galvanic Relay against these hot band decks that struggle to close out the game and allow you to rebuild into Galvanic Relays. So I was able to go for a turn one and outgrind them in the long game. It was quite powerful. Uh, and then my opponent was late this round, so they just got a game loss. And then they won game two on the play. Game three, I just Galvanic Relay them into the dirt. Like turn one Galvanic Relay for seven, turn two Galvanic Relay for six, win on turn three, easy peasy. I get paired against Billy Mitchell. I tell them the story about how my opponent uh, from the previous round, like they felt like their storm matchup was pretty good. And Billy's like, oh no, I know that the Epic Storm's a bad matchup. And then Billy just crushes me. Uh, Billy's a powerful wizard, but... Billy also came extremely prepared, but we'll get to that in a second. So, uh, game one, I keep a hand that's Mox Opal, Bobble, Bobble, Mox Opal, Veil of Summer, Veil of Summer, Ad Nauseam on the play. Maybe I should have mulliganed that, but I was like, okay, well, I get to Bobble at least once if I hit. Like, maybe this goes somewhere. I can also cycle a Veil of Summer. I'll keep it. And I think ultimately I should have mulliganed. But I, I think the hand was very, very, very close. So uh, I lose that one. And then in game two, Billy has turn three maddening hex with force back up. And I don't board an abrupt decay in that matchup because most lists only play a single null rod. And the odds of you having one of your two abrupt decays and they have null rod, you have the mana to cast it and it's relevant. It's just like two stars aligning. It can happen, but it's not ideal. And it makes your deck worse by boarding to begin with. So I've decided that I'm not boarding in my decays in that matchup anymore. And I get punished by Billy's uh, Madding Hex. Billy actually had two of them. All right, that's the end of my event. And now we'll go back to Magic Online for a little bit. Okay, so this is what I played Saturday. This is what I went 4-4 four, four, scrub out with. That night... I was talking to Anthony Laverde, who was formerly on the Epic Storm team, who was off playing Cephalid Breakfast. They played Grixis Delver in the main event. They went 7-2 for a respectable finish. Anthony's also a part of the Accumulated Nonsense podcast. Go check that out. And I was talking with Anthony, and I was like, I just can't play Xanid Swarm anymore. Uh, the Bowmasters were everywhere in the room like i only faced it in that one bug scam matchup but they were everywhere around me like all over the place bowmasters and esper grixis demir bug scam like all over the place and i was like xanid Storm isn't reliable anymore and i don't think that i want to play a list that is tuned for last week's metagame so i say that i'm going to switch back to thought Seize, which was ultimately one of my issues with this deck list because against death and taxes you have to board in xanda's form to beat mind break traps which felt pretty bad so here i get to go back to boarding in thought seas versus death and taxes along with chain of vapors and abrupt decays why not crash what's wrong with crash absolutely nothing it's a fine card but it's ultimately very very narrow and saturday i felt like i wanted more versatile cards in my deck which is why i wanted thought seas to begin with so why not play a versatile answer in Chain of Vapor as well? So I fixed my sideboard, I ran it back, and really that's the only change. It's still the Infernal Tutor uh, build that we've been crushing with, getting those main deck Galvanic Relays for five mana lines. It's been so, so powerful, and it really allows you to push the advantage. So we play that in the Saturday 5K. Paul Lynch... Uh, has been playing Legacy just as long as I have, usually on Stoneblade decks. Well, they switched to Cephalid Breakfast. We had a pretty good match. Uh, Paul had a turn four in game one with Orm's Chant, Days Force Backup, because I tried to go off a few times and just got stopped. And then game two uh, was a really long game. I actually drew every... I kept a two lander. I drew every single fetchable plus two extra lands at one point. Never found a brainstorm, but I did draw three thought season and an abrupt decay. I ended up boarding an abrupt decay, which I usually don't do, but that actually ended up winning me the game. So we go to game three, and I have a turn three ad nauseum with Veil backup while disrupting Paul's combo with an abrupt decay, but Paul recovers faster than I can and wins game three. Uh, round two, I face Sebastian 
on Black Red Reanimator, and Chain of Vapor single-handedly won this match because Sebastian searched out Sears Emissary plus Gristlebrand every game. And without Chain of Vapor, I don't think Epidemic the Warns would have beaten Sears Emissary plus Gristlebrand. It would have been too much because I would have had to ad nauseum repair lower than 14 power with Life Link in the air. So Chain of Vapor, MVP this match. I then get paired against Michael, who is Killer SUV on Magic Online. They're on Blue Zenith. Uh, double Galvanic Relay in Game 1. Game 2, they have Double Collector Roof. Game 3, I get to Double Galvanic Relay them. Ultimately, not that exciting of a match. Uh, then, I have no idea what this person, Dylan, is on. But they have a Mox Diamond playmat. They have green sleeves. You can make a guess. So... When you go to a large event, sometimes people do that stuff to throw your opponents off. I wasn't going to read into it, but I open up a hand that's like, once again, Lotus Petal, Lion's Eye Diamond, Lion's Eye Diamond, Mox Opal, Dark Ritual, Infernal Tutor, Rite of Flame, and I'm like, well, if my opponent's playing Force of All, I lose here. But I go all in, and I go, all right, Diamond, Diamond, Opal, and instantly they just start throwing a fit. Of course, you've opened up the turn one. And I'm like, all right, like, let's not, you know, do that. And they're like, oh, I just lost the die roll and now I'm being punished and all this other sort of stuff. Just kind of throwing a tantrum. I put my ad nauseum on the stack and I win the game. Game two, they're on the play. They open up turn one sphere. I have two lands, Lotus Petal, Mox Opal, a Bobble, uh, Abrupt Decay in hand with a Brainstorm and like a Rite of Flame or something like that. That might have been eight cards, but maybe one of those was my draw step. I don't remember. Um... But I just get wastelanded into the dirt, and I never get up to three mana for the Abrupt Decay. Uh, game number three, I believe I mulligan. Hmm, I thought I mulliganed, but I guess it was just turn two peer into the Abyss. Um, that part I do remember, but I thought I might have mulliganed. But I, when I put in my results, I checked my notepad, so my notepad's always right. It's just maybe I'm misremembering. But uh, it was turn two peer into the Abyss. I, I did have a turn one thought seize as well. Uh, then Alex Vu, who uh, was one of my more pleasant opponents on the weekend, and I made a joke with them, which I do believe is true, and it's that people that work out and really take care of themselves, like Alex was a very muscular man, and um, I feel like those people tend to care a lot about themselves and their appearance, and they're low-risk, low-variance people in real life. Well, what do those people play in Magic the Gathering? Usually islands. Alex leads with Island Ponder. And I chuckled to myself. Alex asks what's funny and I share it. And Alex is like, no way that's a real thing. Definitely is. Think about it. It's either they're on islands or Maverick. Like definitely one of the two. Um, so I ultimately end up beating Alex on Delver because that's what the Epic Storm does. Billy Mitchell is just a jerk who plays Maddening Hex. Make sure you tell Billy that. Um <laughs> Uh, I then get paired against Spencer, who was actually at a table near me. I didn't see Spencer all weekend, but uh, Spencer, th during this round, was at a table near me, and I got to see that they were on Moon Stompy. So I win the die roll, and I just turn one them. Game two, they go turn one, Magus of the Moon, Chal, zero, and that's enough to beat my hand. Game three, I mulligan to five. My opening hand is... All right, so it's Brainstorm. I should do it like this, right? That's how fingers work. It's Brainstorm, Lotus Petal... Infernal Tutor, Lion's Eye Diamond, and a land. Like a Blood Seam I don't know. Uh, but even if I brainstorm into Dark Ritual, I don't have enough mana to ad nauseum. So I go land, main phase, brainstorm. Maybe I hit like the upkeep ad nausea or something. I don't. But I do have a turn two. So uh, Spencer goes turn one, Mountain, from Mox. They think for a second. They put a Rabble Master underneath it, and then take the Rabble out and put Simeon Spirit Guide underneath. Go Chal Zero No Rod, and I'm like, oh come on, is is my winning in really going to go like this? And it was tough. So I ultimately, over the course of the next few turns, just flood. Uh, I actually hit all five fetchable lands. Okay, and then, but here's the thing, Spencer pitched the Simeon Spirit Guide instead of the Rabble Master, and gets stuck on that one land the entire time doesn't hit another land i drop the five land so we have the opposite problem and then i rip burning wish i burning wish pulverize away my lion's eye diamond that's already on the table but here's the thing my hand is dark ritual lion's eye diamond 
uh, Infernal Tutor still, and I just put Ad Nauseum on the stack and win the game. In the next round, I get Hunter Sandlin, who we sat next to each other one round. I knew that they were on Black Saga Storm. Hunter, once again, thank you for the donation doc. I'm already 24 minutes into this uh, intro, and we're not even playing Magic yet. So uh, I keep a turn one Veil of Summer into turn two Ad Nauseum, easy peasy. Hunter turn ones me game two. Game three, I keep a hand that's a turn two. If my bobble hits a dark ritual, a lion's eye diamond, or a lotus petal, I don't have Veil of Summer. But in game one, I told Hunter I wasn't keeping a hand without Veil of Summer. So Hunter game three goes, uh, I go lion's eye diamond, bobble, mox opal, land, pass with land infernal tutor in hand. And Hunter plays a bunch of bobble, a pair of lion's eye diamonds, and an ancient tomb, and a mox opal. They have one card in hand and they pass the turn. I bobble on the end step, I look and see it's a thought seize, I fetch it away, I untap, and I draw, it's another land, and then Lotus Petal, I hit. So I'm able to put turn two Ad Nauseam on the stack and win the game. Alright, so I was the second seed going into top eight, I get paired against Eric, who is on Red Painter, I have a turn two Peer into the Abyss in that matchup, I keep a triple bobble hand, and I rip the Burning Wish, with a ton of mana, and I put Peer onto the stack easy peasy. Game two, Eric has turn one, Thorn and Amethyst, uh, into turn two, Painter Servant, and then grab Grindstone and kills me. Like, the a very good Painter start. Game three, I have turn two, Peer into the Abyss, and that's literally the match. I cast a lot of Peers in this event. A lot of Peers, a lot of Relays. Um, it's sort of just how it went. And then in top four, I get paired against Lands. There is an announcement that says hey, uh, this location is closing in 20 minutes, and I joke to Kurt, and I'm like, I don't think you can win in 20 minutes. Good luck. And then Kurt opens, I mulligan, and I keep a turn three win hand. I sat next to Kurt one round. I had friends that played against Kurt, and I asked them, does Kurt have main deck sphere resistance? None of them knew. None, none of my friends even saw it out of Kurt. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to keep this turn three win on a mulligan to six. Well, Kurt has... Turn one wasteland, turn two uh, sphere. And, well, I lose that game. We go to game two. I mulligan uh, to six, okay? I mulligan to six. Kurt has turn one land, exploration, ancient tomb sphere, turn two merit lodge. That's the end of my event. Turn one sphere and a turn two merit lodge. And uh, hard to be upset. Like, the list ran very, very well. It was very smooth. I loved the changes. And, you know, the deck list was great. So that is what we will be playing today. Once again, Hunter, I'm sorry for those of you that wanted uh, to watch some magic and I just sat here and blabbed for 30 minutes or so. But I wanted to share my event with you and, well, show you the power of Infernal Tutor again. I know it's been a long time, but this list was just incredible. I'm definitely locked in on this 60 for a while. The sideboard might have some adjustments, but I'm pretty happy with four thought sees. Maybe the chain of vapor should be something else, but they were really good for me this weekend. I will say that. So this is going to be something that sticks around. I've already updated the epicstorm.com slash deck list and the card choices. I have a lot in there on Infernal Tutor and Urza's Bobble. Definitely go check that out. But thank you for watching me blab for 30 minutes. I do appreciate it. I'm going to grab a drink and then we'll head on over to match number one. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. You can also show your support by becoming a member of this channel. You get sweet perks such as badges, emotes, early access to videos, exclusive members only content, and access to our members discord section. As you increase the tiers, there are other rewards such as shop discounts, cyborg guides, and even free donation decks. Click the join button down below to find out more. We also have other ways you can support us like theepicsroom.com slash shop or submitting a donation deck via theepicsroom.com slash donation decks. That's enough for now. Let's play some magic. Welcome to the first round. We're on the Dragon's Morrison 90. I faced them a bunch over the last two weeks and they were typically on the bug scam deck, sometimes with an Atroxa package in there for the reanimate as well. They had Entomb that got either Atroxa or Life from the Loam for Wasteland. And here we've opened up just an unplayable hand. We're going to send that one back. Okay, so this one's Probably fine. We'll keep this and we'll get rid of a Mox Opal. Turn one polluted delta. 
not a bad card. We're going to play out the bobble. We'll use it right away just because if I end up casting the brainstorm, I want to be able to not redraw a card. And we end up revealing Wasteland. Okay. So I also really wish that Daybreak game would fix this so that I could keep my sideboard out instead of it just constantly shifting zones. It would be lovely. Lion's Eye Diamond is a very good draw. All right, we'll play the Volcanic and pass. They're likely going to use the Wasteland. We'll cast Brainstorm. Am I getting... What's going on here? Okay. Well, Masters. Okay. I guess I should have thought about that. I mean, we are in Era of the Orcs. So I'll fetch again. Yeah, I guess I. this is me realizing I need to adjust my play pattern. So they're going to get a pretty big orc here. And they're going to force will the other brainstorm. Okay. So they have three cards in hand. They're going to shoot me for some damage. And then my volcanic island will be destroyed. Um, I cannot cast the ad nauseum. What to do, what to do. They have three in hand. I think I'm supposed to get rid of the Veil of Summer. Okay. So they're going to shoot me for three. They'll get a four, four. And then next turn they attack me for a five. So we're currently looking at an ad nauseum from nine, assuming that this relay is okay. And they're F6. If you didn't notice so they likely don't have anything here unfortunately i'm a mana short on the ad nauseum right now maybe i should have put the ad nauseum back and kept the veil in case we reveal an infernal tutor so we have peer into the abyss but there's a bowmaster in play that's awkward i did reveal three mana though but it would be an ad nauseum from nine from eight my bad okay land three and another burning wish do we have a line here that wins the game without casting Ad Nauseum or Peer into the Abyss or Echo of Aeons? Let's find out. All right, so I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe I can do a Grape Shot plus Tendrils line here. So that line would be 4 plus 2 is 6, 2 plus 2, is so 10 mana. And we have 8, 11. So we would start on Burning Wish for Grape Shot. And that would be four. Storm four. And then tendrils would be six. So that would be 16, putting them to two. That is not good enough. Um, so I believe instead what I'm supposed to do is just cast the ad nauseum. It's possible that they have another bowmaster in hand. So we don't want to go to one if we don't have to. We're just looking for storm here. That's it. So we'll cast Ad Nauseum, hold priority, we'll add black, and then red, which is enough mana to cast Tendrils already. And they have another force, so they must have drawn it for turn. Okay, so they have one card in hand. I mean, we could just empty here. We can empty or we can Galvanic Relay for six. Hmm. Twelve Goblins versus one Orc Army and one Bowmasters. I'm going to take the Empty the Warrens. We'll cast it. I think the Veil of Summer would have been better than the Ad Nauseum. So maybe I messed up on the Brainstorm. Okay. So no attack. We'll play a Misty. And now we'll swing out. Even if they block both. Wait, am I dead to another Bowmaster here? Oh, what was I thinking? I need to get used to playing Magic. That, that was a bad move. I'm dead to another orc. They didn't fetch before they drew. So they wanted their top card. And then they conceded. So I think they realized that another orc didn't win. And one was their top card. I just punted really badly. Uh, I got away with it, but I, I made a big error there. Uh, I need to get used to playing around Bowmaster. All right. So we'll swap this back. We want to bring in Abrupt Decay for Collector Roof. We'll board out one of each bobble. And you could board out Brainstorm for Thoughtseize. That's a choice you can make. I'm not going to. I think that we still want that card in our deck versus the Grief Package. And oh my, what a hand. Keep. Turn one by you. Draw. Another Veil. We will pass the turn. 
I realize that I'm passing into Bowmaster again, but I just don't plan on casting the Brainstorm now until they tap low, and I want to keep my Land Protector from Wasteland. I mean, that wasn't bad. And there's the Bowmaster. So now I will cast the Brainstorm. Be good to me, Doc. Be good. Uh, a little awkward. I guess I could relay next turn. Assuming that I don't get hit by Wasteland. So, ah, oh, why did I open up my mouth? Yep. Ouch. We'll play a Bobble. Pass the turn. They cast a Brainstorm on their end step. On my end step, I'm sorry. We'll look at their top card. It's a Ponder. So, on my upkeep, they will get a slightly larger Orc token, and I'll take one. And I'm punished for waiting on the Bobble. Oh, that's so brutal. Okay. So that draw is stopped. That's weird. It worked like this. Um, oh, so it did let me draw off the bobble ability. Okay, that, that makes sense. Ignore me. This went ha as it should have. I'll play Lion's Eye Diamond and pass the turn. Pretty sure I've lost this one. Maybe I wasn't supposed to brainstorm in response to the Bowmaster playing into Wasteland. Maybe I should have just accepted taking some extra damage and not putting myself in that position. All right, I'm going to concede to that, and we can go to game three. We had a very good hand there, too. All right, I'm going to try no brainstorms this time, and I'm going to bring back in the bobbles, so that way my opals are consistent. We'll try two main deck thought seeds. All right, game three on the play. Hmm. So this is a weird hand because Burning Wish would require me to play out all my bobbles and stuff but then i have to play out all of my resources for a relay so it's just very odd i think i'm gonna try it but i'm not sold also this is the hand is kind of risky if our opponent has forcible plus surgical extraction bobble another bobble mox opal we'll fetch go we'll grab taiga there's no need to fetch blue duels. All of our blue cards are in our sideboard. Burning Wish. And they do force it, pitching a Hydro Blast. And their upkeep will bobble them. They have a Thought Seize, so we're about to lose our other Burning Wish. Yep. We'll look at a random card in their hand. An Orcish Bowmasters. Okay. Dark Ritual, another bobble. And we'll fire this off immediately. Another Bowmaster. So they have. We've revealed the same one, or they have multiple. Okay, we have a lot of Right of Flames. Burning Wish 3. We'll pass the turn. Strong start. So they had Forcible Thought Seize into Bowmasters. And we're not out of this, for what it's worth. Like a Burning Wish off the top could be very, very good for us. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. It's also worth noting that you could still Echo of Aeons into this if you wanted to. Because it doesn't kill you. You just have to win that turn. So that gives us hypothetical metal craft, even though we have nothing to do with our mana. So Infernal Tutor just became a live draw. Dothy Voidwalker. And Ponder. We haven't seen a grief yet, but there's a lot of black cards. We go to 14, take a draw. Abrupt Decay. So it could kill the Dothy. I don't even know if I want to, though. I guess it buys time, and that would be the reason to do it. All right, they have three cards. We'll pass for now, I guess. They play a land, and there's a grief, so they do have it. We will kill the Dothy Voidwalker. All right, so they're attacking for two, and we'll go to 12. Let's find a tutor effect here. I'd love to put Ad Nauseam on the stack from 12. No such luck. I'm going to choose to wait rather than play into extra damage here. We'll look at their top card. Surgical Extraction. I believe we just lost the game. I chose not to board in Tendrils of Agony, and now they can exile our Burning Wishes. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Yep. And that'll do. So, unfortunately, we lost match number one. I made a few bonehead plays, and game three, our, our draw just never really came together. Uh, we needed mana early, I didn't have it, and then we had mana and I needed tutors, which we didn't have anymore. Um, so, kind of a weird one. 
ultimately, this match is probably my own fault why we lost. I could have played better game two. I think just like the spare damage off Bowie Masters didn't matter. And I knew that I was afraid of Wasteland, so I had no reason to play into the Wasteland. So kind of a bonehead move. Learning to adjust with new cards, right? Like I didn't actually face Bowmasters that much at the event, despite there being a bunch of it around me. And uh, we're learning together. So bear with me. Sometimes I misplay. I'm not perfect. Let's see if I can do better in match number two. Moxfield.com is the easiest way to build a Magic deck online. They support over 30 formats, including Legacy and many other Eternal formats. There are so many options to view decks the way that you want, from text view to individual cards, mana value, and even card price. There's also light mode and dark mode. My personal favorite feature is card tags. This way you can sort cards by function. Moxfield supports collection tracking, scryfall search, deckless feedback, and so much more. Follow me on Moxfield.com so you can stay updated on all of my decks. Match number two on the play. I face this person a bunch of times. They usually play four color pile decks or can't control that sort of thing. Here we have a hand with not any mana. I don't really like relying on bobbles to hit, so we're just going to send it back for hopefully a better hand. A little bit awkward. We'll go to five. This isn't bad. All right, so we can go. Well, we can force check them. That is an option we have here. Or we can just wait until we find another mana source to be protected, and I'd rather do that. So we'll keep these five. And by that, like, the game plan here is to cast Echo of Aeons, if I'm not clear. So we could have just spun the wheel immediately and disrespected our opponent playing Force of Will. I think that's a pretty risky move when I can just wait for a land. Another Veil of Summer. Okay, so we drew a cantrip. And this goes back to the deck tech where I mentioned how these are more than just protection spells. So I can go look for that extra mana sword. Okay, they grab a basic. Staff of the Storyteller, you've got it. Okay, we'll take a draw. There it is, so do we want to spin? We could also just start with a Veil of Summer and see what happens. And I don't hate that, so let's use the Verdant Catacombs because we know we're grabbing a Taiga here. A Veil of Summer. All right, so now we get to Echo while being protected. We do need a red source here, so would you rather have a blue source or a black source? Personally, I'd rather have a black source. So we'll grab Badlands, Ride of Flame, Burning Wish. We'll go grab that cyborg copy of Echo of Aeons, the Lion's Eye Diamond. So we have made our land drop. We have no mana floating. This is not a... It, I mean, it could be. Don't get me wrong. But the plan here is to restock. It's not necessarily just to win. If we win, that's super awesome. But I'm also just fine unmulliganing myself. Would have been nice to draw into a Galvanic Relay, I won't lie. Uh, but we'll do this now. So we're going to bobble on our main phase to avoid something like Narset. So they have Forcible Wasteland. Thankfully, we have four lands and don't really care about the Wasteland that much. Burning Wish, that's a good one, and Ad Nauseam. Okay. We lose our Badlands. What a shame. Two mana for another copy of Staff of the Storyteller. They have six cards. We'll take one down to 17. Draw. Another land. Let's try Burning Wish. That resolves. Okay. So, something our opponent could do is and this is part of the reason why thought sees isn't a perfect card is they could brainstorm forceful to the top and then redraw it with staff of the storyteller so if we're worried about them having counter magic i could get a galvanic relay here and try to play a longer game which might be the right move uh, i could also get thought sees and try to jam an ad nauseum down their throat next turn which might work as well the downside is if they do have a brainstorm, we're probably not winning. The downside of Galvanic Relay is I'm um, expending a lot of resources into a relay. Maybe it should just be the relay. It's probably safer. Mm. I really don't want to lose to a brainstorm. I'm going to grab Galvanic Relay. So we are now battling Staff of the Storyteller's card advantage with Galvanic Relay. So we're sort of playing into our opponent's game plan at the moment, which I don't love. Ponder. The one upside here is that if our opponent had double counter magic, 
we don't lose to that because galvanic relay sort of just rewards us for people casting spells we'll take two we'll go to 15 sure thing and another right of flame that was actually quite good we'll fetch grab the volcanic island so that way the verdant catacombs can grab by you so this would give us eight mana so this is actually enough to add nauseam into the relay assuming that all the rituals resolve Okay, that's the staff of the Storyteller activation. How about another Rite of Flame? What about a Dark Ritual? Really? When you know that I have Galvanic Relay in hand. Okay. Uh, sure. So they have five cards. So the question is, do you play out the Lion's Eye Diamond to get hit by Prismatic Ending? Or do you hold it in hand? Right now, I think our Choke Point is a tough call. I think I'm going to hold it. Okay. Five cards. The question is, is Lion's Eye Diamond better than a random card off the top? I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. And the best card I could hit is another Rite of Flame or Dark Ritual. So we hit a lot of payoffs, but no mana. So that's actually pretty awkward. Something I could do, though, is Infernal Tutor for another Lion's Eye Diamond into Double Galvanic Relay. So that actually might work out quite well. I should just close this sideboard. I'm so tired of resizing it. All right, so our opponent's drawn a few cards off Staff of the Storyteller. They do it in their main phase here. And I'll take two. I'll go to 12 life. Another Lion's Eye Diamond. Good deal. So let's, let's start off by fetching. Let's go get that by you. We'll cast Infernal Tutor. See if it resolves. And if it doesn't at this point, sweet. It does. We'll grab a Lion's Eye Diamond. Let's play it. We will have to sacrifice a pair of Lion's Eye Diamonds here to play the Galvanic Relays, but I believe it will be worthwhile. Okay. So we're going to have a Galvanic Relay for six and then another for seven. Thirteen cards. Okay. Galvanic Relay. Bloodstained Mire, Brainstorm, Rite of Flame, Dark Ritual, Veil of Summer, and Infernal Tutor. We'll then use this Galvanic Relay for the next one. So, seven. Okay. We'll just bobble them now. They're drawing an island. So, the reason... Another heuristic that you have to change is that when you have a bunch of bobbles like this, it's not always free to just activate them post-Galvanic Relay anymore. Because if you do, you could be punished. Uh, because there's some situations in which you will not be able to create Hellbent for your Infernal Tutor. This is not one of those situations. Even if I drew a land here, and then a land for my draw step, I could brainstorm them away, or we, I actually have multiple brainstorms, and I have a Lion's Eye Diamond on the table. My opponent has drawn roughly infinite cards uh, this game off the staff of the storytellers and galvanic relay is still looking like it's going to put them in the grave we had the choice of thought sees ad nauseum and i believe we made the correct choice of not doing that as we guessed prismatic ending exiles the lion's eye diamond from a few turns ago they get in for three i'll go to eight life and they have seven cards can we beat their interaction i'm willing to bet yes but i could always be wrong Main phase, Eternal Masters Brainstorm. Yikes. One of the benefits of uh, a sponsor of this channel, Card Hoarder, is you get to pick your versions, by the way. You are not subjected to whatever the loan team has to rent out. You can pick uh, Onslaught Flooded Strands if that's what you're into. They're also just the best. Like, I love Card Hoarder. Even if I wasn't sponsored, I would say that. I paid for Card Hoarder before I was sponsored, so definitely check out their service. All right, time to try to win the game here. Let's play some Bobbles. Okay, so we have a Mox Opal. Lotus Petal. It's free to play the Mire as a free shuffle for Brainstorm. Let's attempt a Brainstorm here. See if we can convert this Mishra's Bobble into something just a little bit more useful. Like a Veil of Summer. We'll put back the pair of fetch lands. We'll fetch. Oh no, there's no more fetchable lands. That's crazy. Can't believe that happened to me. We'll cast Rite of Flame off the Volcanic. 
Dark Ritual from hand. This might be a spell our opponent wants to fight over. They let it go. Okay. And now I'm going to Infernal Tutor for a card in our hand. Oh, they just decided to concede. Okay. Well, I was going to get a third copy of Veil of Summer, and then we have Taiga, Mox Opal, Lotus Petal, plus Burning Wish. So our opponent would need four counter spells, four hard counter spells to stop me there. Uh, so if you look at this game, it was a turn seven grind fest, but I had the option to play more aggressively. I chose not to. We went for the relay line and we were rewarded. So you don't have to be aggressive just because you're playing Storm. Play to the matchup. That's really my message here. All right, Abrupt Decay comes in. So in a lot of these matchups, I've just been boarding out the artifact plan because speed isn't the name of the game. So I'm bringing in some Abrupt Decays, and then I'm going to bring in more protection as well. Um, you just don't have to be fast, and sometimes these control decks overload, so why not bring in a little bit of extra protection just to make sure that you can get the job done. Game number two, we're on the draw. This is a pretty interesting hand. So we have Metalcraft for the Mox Opal, but is this like we need multiple mana sources in order to make this work? Against a non-blue deck, I'd probably snap this off. But we're looking to play a longer game, and I can't really afford to have my Mox Opal hit by Prismatic Ending. If I miss, I think you're supposed to go to six. Okay, we've opened up another explosive hand. Are we just going to disrespect Force of Will? Is that the game plan here? I mean, sure. All right. Turn one mountain. Oh, so they definitely have Force of Will. Okay. <laughs> sure. We'll play an Underground Sea and Pass. You don't keep this without having Force of Will. Tundra. So they drew a blue source. I'm going to pass. I don't want to play into Pyroblast. See if they tap some mana at some point. And they choose not. Okay. Another Infernal Tutor. I'll play Lotus Petal. Pass. Brainstorm on the end step. They fetch in their upkeep. We did see a Wasteland in game one. That is a card that's on my mind. Hoping that they don't find it, but you can only do so much. Land number four. And they choose to leave open the mountain here. So they are strongly presenting Pyroblast. Just don't play into their tricks if you don't have to. We'll play Lion's Eye Diamond. Mox Opal. I'll Infernal Tutor here. See if this gets countered or surgical. I'd rather that happen than my Burning Wish. And we'll grab another Brainstorm. So if they're going to hold open Pyroblast, maybe we can overload their mountain. They grab a basic plane, so there might be a back to basics in our future. And there's the surgical. So I'm glad that I did not play the Burning Wish that turn. They do get to rip one out of my hand. I could, I mean, and I'm, this isn't a play mistake. I consciously chose not to respond to the surgical. So our opponent strongly representing Pyroblast this entire game. I could have sacrificed my Lotus Petal to play Brainstorm. By doing so, I lose Metalcraft, and if they have a Prismatic Ending, it puts me super far behind. So I am choosing to not play into their tricks and instead just be a little bit more disciplined, like I should have been in match number one, and just be patient. Three mana for a back to basics. Right? Four mana. Ruination. Pretty close. And they played out a fetch land for no reason? That's a little odd. Okay. Draw. Another opal. Okay. Let's see a thought sees here. Or a veil of summer. Ding! So this could be a protected peer into the abyss here. They would need double force to stop me. Alright, I mean if you have double force, you have double force. I'm not going to um play around you having the perfect four cards in hand. So let's peanut butter and jam. Right of flame. Right of flame. The opponent concedes. All right, so we got it. We were disciplined, and we won because of it. Strictly that, no other reason whatsoever. Um, I'm being sarcastic. Please don't take everything I take seriously, or say seriously. All right, 1-1. One, one, three matches left. Um, let's continue to play tight and win games.
Looking to make playing your favorite combo deck much easier? Look no further than the Epic Storm Mini Token Combo Pack, which is available at theepicstorm.com slash shop for $14.99. This combo token pack comes with 84 double-sided tokens. That includes our classic Storm and Mana tokens, as well as fan favorites such as Goblins, Squirrels, and Slime Time Live. But that's not all. We've expanded this token pack to cover a variety of formats with new tokens. Stop on by the epicstorm.com slash shop and make an easy decision to elevate your combo game. Round number three on the play. I have no clue what our opponent's playing. And we've opened up a hand with a lot of Veil of Summers. Um, this hand is really good if our opponent's playing blue and pretty bad if they're not. Let's see how it goes. Turn one Bloodstained Mire will pass the turn. Okay, Scalding Tarn. I suppose they could still be goblins, but these veils look live at least for now. Lotus Petal. Lotus Petal. Are you sneaking, Cho? I'm about to be punished for the slow keep. Uh-oh, they just have a turn one? That's the way to do it, I, I guess. The Suvin Drifter. Okay. They have three cards in hand. The Drifter triggers, and they're passing. I think I'm supposed to cycle one of these Veil of Summers. We'll grab a Taiga, cycle, Bobble, okay, draw, another Infernal Tutor. Let's fetch. We'll cast an Infernal, reveal Bobble. So you could try to hold everything for like a Galvanic Relay, but I don't think that's a luxury we have. So I'm just trying to draw into Lion's Eye Diamonds so we can actually win this game. And their upkeep, we'll look at what they have been looking at, I suppose. Ancient Tomb. Okay. Vesuv and Drifter becomes, or triggers at least. And nothing. So they'll swing for two, we'll go to 16. They play the Ancient Tomb. Alright, and... Reordain. So that's a good draw for them next turn. So we get to find three cards here. Dark Ritual is a good start. Brainstorm, I love that. And another Opal. Okay. So let's cast the Brainstorm. All right, so we're getting closer to being able to win. We'll tuck these Mox Opals away. Use the Misty. We have to fade another turn here from our opponent, I believe. So hypothetically, I could go Dark Ritual... Infernal Tutor floating a black. Go get right of flame. So I could like Galvanic Relay for a bunch here. Storm is one. If for some reason they interacted, I could get pretty close to a natural tendrils. Maybe relay's just better. So my plan was to infernal tutor for a dark ritual and get Yeah, I should just try to relay here. Who, who am I kidding? Alright. Dark ritual. Let's attempt an infernal tutor. Right of flame. Now I'll play out the pedal. Looks like they're actually F6. Burning Wish, Storm 7. So I could empty the Warrens for 16, but I don't think that's actually a whole lot different. You, you might also be saying I could Grape Shot the Vesuvian Drifter. I don't think that's a winning line. Like, I think that's a coward's line. You're never going to win a game by doing that. So what I'm deciding right now is between empty the Warrens Galvanic Relay and Veil of Summer into Galvanic Relay. Our opponent has shown us that they don't have counter magic in hand. So that is what I'm trying to figure out here. Pretty sure it's Relay. And I will Veil of Summer just to make sure that they don't have a main deck fluster in hand. If they're a fan of Brian Koval, his list had. Oh, well, they're just going to concede to a Preordain? They have a Preordain on top. That makes no sense. Okay, our opponent didn't want to play magic. But I'll take a free win. Here we can bring in Thoughtseize and board out Relays. One thing that you got to see in that first game was the flexibility of Infernal Tutor. Yeah, we didn't go get Ad Nauseam or a main deck copy of Galvanic Relay. But we were able to turn it into a cantrip with Mishra's Bobble just to speed things along. We were also able to double increase our Storm Count on a Galvanic Relay turn which is really, really difficult to do with Wishclaw Talisman without being punished. So 
Infernal Tutor does a lot of small things. We also weren't afraid to cast Brainstorm without a fetch land. Uh, there was a turn where I ended up drawing into the Misty Rainforest, but if it missed, Infernal Tutor could have been a way to shuffle away Brainstorm as well. It just offers a lot of flexibility in the deck. And when I started playing this list or lists like this one in our Discord, Alex McKinley said to me, Oh, Bryant, you haven't lost any of your heuristics for playing Infernal Tutor because it just felt like home for me. Like, I had been doing it for so long, and only these last few years have I been a Wishclaw Talisman gamer. So I just remembered all of these nice interactions and tricks with the Infernal Tutor that others may have forgotten, but I don't know, it just feels right. No mana. Her opponent has taken a mulligan. I believe we're supposed to do the same. I mean, this hand is powerful. The question is, do you keep the Spare Veil of Summer, or do you keep the Mox Opal? I believe I'm going to keep the Veil of Summer. And if our opponent just has a turn one or two, Gristlebrand, so be it. Thunder. I just realized our opponent might have thought that I could cast the cards immediately off of Galvanic Relay. They shuffled on the Ponder. That might have been why they conceded. Lotus Petal. Missy Rainforest. Mishra's Bobble. Let's target ourselves. Another Opal. I don't need you. Grab that Taiga. We'll pass the turn. Draw Rite of Lame. Okay. Burning Wish one time. Pretty please. And a Brainstorm. No fetch land. Okay. So you could cycle Veil of Summer. With our opponent's keep, I feel like they have an interaction heavy hand. Another diamond. So now Infernal Tutor also is a great draw. We were a little bit short on a protected win with Infernal last turn, but that's not the case anymore. And they don't have a play here, so that definitely screams that they have interaction. Another land for us. Okay. Pass the turn. Please don't kill me. Land number four. So they're one mana away from sneak attack kill you. We'll fetch to thin here. Grab Underground Sea, I guess. Draw. Thought Seas, that was a good one. All right, we're going to play out the Lotus Petal to avoid days here. And I'm thinking a little bit ahead. So I'm thinking Underground Sea cast Thought Seas. If they counter it, I want a Veil. I want a Veil, and I don't want to lose to a daze. So we'll start off, cast the Thought Seas. They have five cards in hand. They exile a Simeon Spirit Guide. What are you doing? Is it through the breach? What's going on here? Through the breach doesn't even make sense. Oh, Hardcast Force Will. Okay. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense than through the breach. I don't know why my mind went to that. We'll grab a Bayou. Veil vale of Summer. The Surgical Mishra's Bobble. Okay, sure. Do me a favor and exile those so I have a greater chance of drawing Infernal Tutor or Burning Wish, please. Our opponent has exiled all of her Mishra's Bobbles. Do I get to draw off this Veil vale of Summer? They have two cards in hand, so Force of Willing the Veil doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We draw a Lotus Petal. All right, Thought Seize. Let's see what you're working with here, opponent. They have a pair of Emrakul. Okay, so I could cycle the Veil here. I think it's a little bit risky. Because even if they have Show and Tell, I can wait and then cycle the Veil. How I get punished for not casting the Veil of Summer here is if... They draw Sneak Attack on their next turn. I think I'm going to just wait. I think cycling this, missing on Infernal Tutor or Burning Wish, and our opponent drawing Fluster Storm really punishes me, and I'm not interested in that. Our opponent passes the turn here. Draw. Okay, that was a good one. Did you draw another Surgical Extraction? Brainstorm. Ding! Okay. So they're at 18. We want this Veil of Summer. We could probably put away the Lotus Petal and Burning Wish. Rite of Flame. Dark Ritual. Veil of Summer. So we have five mana. And then a pair of Lion's Eye Diamonds is six. So that's 11 mana. I believe we can do what the kids back in the day used to call tutor chaining, which is just. Infernal Tutor for Infernal Tutor into Burning Wish. All right, so we have nine mana. So Infernal Burning Wish Tendrils is eight. 
So that works out. That's actually one extra, but I just want to show you that you could do this. We're actually one storm over, but for sake of argument, if our opponent was at 20, this is a line that you have access to. Okay, that's 20 drills. Technically 10 drills. I don't know. Math is tough. Leave me alone. We're 2-1. and one. I'll take it. All right. A lot of blue decks so far. We're doing okay. I'm remembering how to play Magic. It's been a few days. And uh, let's go see if we can win the last two. The Command Tower software by Eminence Gaming is perfect for hosting your own Magic events with features such as easy to create event registration for four player and one on one Swiss based games. Event management has never been so simple and it's done on the web, no downloads are required. You can sign up for $5 by visiting eminence.events slash subscribe. All right, we are recording. So match number four, and as you can see, this is a Magic Online replay. I didn't forget to click OBS record, I promise you. I went to go hit record as the match ended. OBS froze and then my computer crashed. When it restored, I did not have the file for match number four. So I think that a Moto replay is the best option that we have. So I'm going to hit this play button. We win the die roll and our opponent reveals a Yorian Sky Nomad. I choose to believe that they're on blue zenith and not death and taxes, immediately punished. So that means that our best draw here is a brainstorm or a burning wish. We miss, and I'm forced to just settle for a galvanic relay. So we play lotus petal, bobble, bobble, diamond, galvanic relay, and then there's some choice to be had here on whether or not you're supposed to sacrifice the bobbles, because they could stop you from theoretically getting hellbent, but... Spirit of the Labyrinth is a card. So what ultimately changes my decision is that we flip a pair of brainstorms on this relay. So you definitely want to use the bobbles. So we use the bobbles, we use the bobbles, and our opponent accidentally skips their turn when uh, on the bobble triggers. So I think they hit F6 on accident with the bobble triggers, and I'm able to untap, cast my artifacts, Dark Ritual, Burning Wish into Peer into the Abyss, and uh, from here, it's just casting a bunch of spells and putting Tendrils of Agony on the stack. Uh, hopefully this speedy round makes up for the super long deck tech intro. But uh, pretty simple stuff from here. And that's game number one versus Dean T. I feel like we were given a favor here with our opponent skipping their first turn. Uh, Athalia would have put us into the dirt and instead we get to put Tendrils of Agony on the stack. Game two, our opponent reveals Yorian. I keep this hand because we have Bobble plus Bloodstain Mire. So if I draw a second land, I can, in theory, abrupt decay a creature. And I Bobble on our turn, so that way my Brainstorm has a better odd of finding land. They actually play Port in a Stoneforge. So I get the impression that they might have Mind Break Trap. Because why wouldn't you keep a hand with Thalia? But we Brainstorm into the absolute nuts, which is Thought Seize. I'm going to pause this for a second. So... You can see here our opponent didn't have it, and they ultimately kept a hand that probably wasn't very good. But I made a small mistake here. I shouldn't have gone Diamond Diamond Thoughtseize. I should have led on the Thoughtseize, um, because if this gets mind breaked, I lose that information. So I should have led here and then played out my artifacts, but they kept a hand that didn't do anything. Small misplay on my part. I just wanted to drive that point home. All right, so from here, we play out a Mox Opal, and then we tap it. We play another Mox Opal, Infernal Tutor, sacrifice both. We're going to search our deck for Ad Nauseum. We're going to cast it floating a red. And we float red because we need red in order to win the game eventually, no matter what. So, and red doesn't require Lion's Eye Diamond, which is another bonus. So we keep flipping, we flip, we flip, we flip. We eventually get up to like 25 cards in hand or something. And then we cast a flurry of spells once again into Tendrils of Agony. So this round was a little bit of a give me. And I'm not trying to speak ill of our opponent. Everybody starts somewhere. Magic is a very difficult game. And no disrespect to our opponent whatsoever. But game one, they accidentally skipped their turn. Game two, they kept a hand that did not do anything meaningful. And this could be a learning opportunity that, hey, your deck has cards in it that are highly impactful. You could have kept a hand with Wasteland in it. You could have kept a hand with Deafeny Silence, Mindbreak Trap, Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, Spirit of the Labyrinth. There was a lot of cards here. Rashad and Port and Stoneforge Mystic, ultimately on their own, are just not good enough. And uh, because of that, we are four, or I'm sorry, three and one. 
and we're trying to be four and one in match number five so let's head on over there hopefully we don't get any crashes or anything like that from memory leaks from magic online but uh i'll see you there no more me blabbing let's head on over with Card Hoarder, renting your favorite combo deck has never been easier. There isn't a more affordable solution for Magic Online. Want to play the deck in this video? Check out the pinned comment below to easily rent the deck from Card Hoarder. Did you know you can rent the Epic Storm from Card Hoarder for as little as 7 tickets a week? We've made it simple to do so by including a button to rent the entire deck at theepicstorm.com slash decklist. All right, time for match number 5. We're on the draw against Maguire CJ, who exclusively plays Chow's The Void decks. And we've opened up a hand that would be a slam dunk in almost any matchup other than Chalice of the Void matchups. So we have Brainstorm, obviously a powerful card. Veil of Summer is pretty interesting because Veil of Summer allows you to play your artifacts through a Chalice of the Void on zero. But we don't have a Burning Wish or Infernal Tutor as a payoff. I think I'm actually kind of inclined to keep this and hope that between our draw step and Brainstorm that we kind of hit what we need to. And that Veil of Summer carries us through a Chalice of the Void on zero. If they have a Chalice of the Void on one or Trinisphere, you don't win them all, especially when you're on the draw. But I think that this hand has the potential. Okay, so turn one Cavern of Souls on human plus Chromox, Chalice of the Void on one. Okay. Did not Chal zero. We had another brainstorm. Pass the turn. And I'm not playing out my Lotus Petal or Lion's Eye Diamond, which might seem weird to you, but if the plan is to pulverize away this Chalice of the Void, I don't want to have to do that. And it looks like they're actually on initiative here. We don't need a, another Lotus Petal. We'll fetch. Grab a red source, so that way... I mean, it seems a little silly, but like the plan here is still pulverized, so we need to play to that. Ultimately, just losing the die roll was what we did wrong this match. And they named Brainstorm with the Anointed Peacekeeper. With a Chalice of the Void for one in play, I'll take it. Alright, so no luck here. I'm going to just choose to move to discard. Because if I draw Burning Wish, the, all these zeros represent Storm Count. So I could empty the Warrens for 12 or 14 or whatever. Another Anointed Peacekeeper. That's not good for us. So now they'll see the Lotus Petals and uh, a little bit punished for the hold. But I, I don't think you should be playing around a second copy of Anointed Peacekeeper. And if they had a Chalice of the Void, they probably would have played it last turn for zero. Yep, that hurt. So now they're attacking for three. Draw. Another Bobble. Okay. Pass. Bobble them in their upkeep. Cavern of Souls. Fable of the Mirror Breaker. They attack for six. I'll go to ten. We get two draws here between the Bobble and our draw step. Galvanic Relay. And I'm actually a mana short of Relay here because the Lotus Petals cost two. That hurts. Relay actually was an amazing draw. So you could... You know what? I'm just going to pass. Discard a Brainstorm. Oh, we actually have to discard two. All right, so I think realistically, our only hope is that I draw Burning Wish and appear into the Abyss. Uh, actually, I, for I forgot about the Lotus Petals. That's not even a line here. Not even a line. Uh, so I don't know what our out Burning Wish into Echo is probably our line, or kind of Emiria, and that will officially be the end of game number one. Okay, lesson learned: win the die roll. Uh, that's all I got. Bummer. Okay, so we want Abrupt Decay, we want Chain of Vapor, we also want Thought Seize. We'll be taking out Galvanic Relays and Veil of Summers. Hit Submit. Game 2, we're on the play. I mean, this hand is good, it's just, is it good enough against Red White Initiative? Like, if you mulligan this hand, you're saying I need to open up a turn 1, because this hand has a pretty good turn 2 rate. I'll keep. All right, so we're going to play a Bloodstained Mire, Urza's Bobble. We'll get a random card in their hand. Anointed Peacekeeper. More like Annoying Peacekeeper, am I right? Okay, so we're going to draw a card off the Bobble here and see what our opponent's going to do. Pretty good draw. 
pretty good draw, but we do have to make it through our opponent's turn unscathed. And our opponent is a living, breathing person, and uh, they're familiar with Magic Online and the matchup, so I have to imagine that they have something to play on turn one. City of Traders. Taps for two. Chalice of the Void on one. Okay. So I'm going to choose to search out Volcanic Island here and cast the Brainstorm. And I'm choosing Volcanic Island because I want the option to pulverize if need be. We will put back the Bloodstained Mire and hide the Infernal Tutor on top. Okay. So I could play out these Bobbles for Storm, but if for some reason our opponent is on Mind Break Trap, is it... Am I really going to play around Mind Break Trap out of initiative? I don't think so. If they Mind Break Trap me, congratulations, you wanted it more. We will hold control, black, and we'll do black, black. Black, black casts Abrupt Decay. Okay, let's pop this out. There's no Galvanic Relays in the deck. There's an Abrupt Decay, Chain of Vapor. Looks like we're a little bit light on mana, but not looking bad so far. I guess we'll stop at five. Mox Opal. We'll kill the Chalice. Play another Opal. Play some Lotus Petals. Dark Ritual. Let's Thought Seize them, see what they kept. Okay, so they wanted to draw a Chrome Mox or turn one Archon of Emeria. So they had turn one Chalice, turn two Archon of Emeria. I wouldn't have shipped that either. This was a perfectly acceptable hand. But uh looks like our hand was just good enough to work. And uh we'll be headed to game number three in just a moment. Grab the tendrils, cast it. Whew. Okay. On the draw, you could bring in Veil of Summer. You could. It's a choice you can make. Because it allows you to beat Chalice of the Void on zero. Our opponent has shown us that they don't like to Chalice zero against us. So, well, also, why is our deck sort of this? This is so weird. There we go. Um, so, I, I don't think I like the, Ch the Veil of Summer play. But also, with Chain of Vapor in the deck, you, you don't have to rely on Veil of Summer to beat Chalice zero. I think the configuration we have is probably the right one. Game three. Our opponent has elected to keep their seven card hand. Here we have a pretty interesting hand. It has a turn one echo. We have some flexibility with brainstorm. It's not super weak to Chalice of the Void on one. I'm going to keep. Chrome Mox. Imprints. Born of the Third Path. They have turn one Archon of Emeria. We're probably not winning this one. Chain of Vapor. Play the Tarn Pass. I think I have to get pretty lucky to win this. We need our opponent, the rest of their hand to just not do anything. Lotus Petal. City of Traders, they have one card. Okay. So Abrupt Decay is also a good card for us. But I guess I should play out the Lotus Petal. Because that allows us to cast it. It's just that Abrupt Decay can't be cast off the Volcanic Island, so it's a little bit weird. Caves of Chaos Adventure. So they've increased their clock. So this brainstorm really needs to hit. Okay, I go to 16. Draw for turn. It's the Abrupt Decay. Okay, so I could cast it right now on the Archon of Emeria. Actually, no, I can't. Because the land on off turn comes into play tapped. So we might as well brainstorm looking for a land drop. We found one. We also found Infernal Tutor number three. I probably don't need that. We'll play our land. So next turn we can do something. Although we won't have a whole lot of life next turn, so Ad Nauseam probably isn't the card we want. They attack for nine, and I go to seven. I don't like them tapping mana. Season Dungeoneer. So this brings them to Forge, which is actually very bad for me, because now I go to two life, which means that this fetch land isn't able to be used next turn. We'll fetch, yeah. I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. I mean, it's possible for us to win, but it's not looking good. Raw. Okay, so we can cast Abrupt Decay to start. Storm is one. So now we have a choice. We can go Rite of Flame, Burning Wish, Echo of Aeons, and 
we have no mana floating. We have a land drop. That's it. Uh, or I can try to brainstorm. And brainstorm would have to hit like a Mox Opal or a Lotus Petal in order to replace itself. It could also hit a red land that isn't a fetch land. Uh, basically, the brainstorm play would be trying to increase your resources in order to win. So it's a guaranteed echo versus additional resources, like trying to convert these Infernal Tutors into something that would actually be useful. Or more mana floating, like another Lion's Eye Diamond plus... I don't know. Really tough call here. There's one Lotus Petal down. So Mox Opal plus another artifact could replace. If you echo, you can't draw a fetch land as your land drop. That's another thing. That season Dungeoneer was absolutely devastating here. I am just at a loss of what to do. In our deck full of bobbles and stuff, I just don't know if I have faith in Echo with no mana, nothing floating, nothing winning the game. You would need literally a perfect hand almost. So you have two red lands, three lotus petals, four opals, but opal would also need to hit another artifact. That's nine hits out of 47 cards with three looks. I don't know what the right play is. I'm just going to put Echo on the stack. I've wasted enough time thinking. Okay. Spin the wheel. Discard her hand at three blue. Echo. This doesn't do it. Bobbles and lands we can't use. So this was the fear. The fear happened. We'll activate her fetch land. So ultimately we went 3-2. Kind of a bummer. So we lost the die roll in the fifth match, which... Is a matchup where you need to win the die rolls, so that's kind of tough. We had opportunities to win the fifth match, but we didn't hit. Like, our opponent put us in a position that made it tough to win when we did have the opportunity, which is what their deck wants to do. So, like, that happens sometimes. Magic, uh, it's an interesting game because of those sort of things. What are my thoughts on the list? I still absolutely love it. One league isn't going to change my mind. I don't plan on changing a single card right now. I would like to thank Hunter Sandlin once again for the donation deck. And uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed the league. I know I didn't play that well in the first round, but hey, maybe it was a learning opportunity for you on what not to do with uh, Orcish Bowmasters being in the format. So everyone, thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. Have a great day and keep storming. Hey, Brian Cook here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe, but also follow the social media channels down below. If you want to support this content directly, I would recommend going to theepicstorm.com shop. And if you need a little bit of assistance with the Epic Storm to get to that next level, I would recommend going to theepicstorm.com tutoring. Don't worry, there's more great content coming right up.